It is a great pleasure today to have Tony Winston with us, who joins us from New York City in the United States. Tony is a web systems engineer with a who is on a mission to rid the world of narrative centric science. Can I tell us more about what that means in a minute? Or less than that. He's also the owner of, and principal of Polyneum LLC, uh, co founder of Fairpoints, the host of machine centric science, and also writes an email newsletter on the verification for research directors and data stewards. Welcome to the show, Donnie Winston. Thank you for having me. Yeah, that's great. So we we met um, not too long ago. Um, I think we've we've crossed paths also on Twitter here and there. Um, your name and space ring ring more than a bell, and then we um, we crossed paths again in the initiative and project called Fairpoints. Can you well? Can you share a few a few words around that? What Fairpoints is, and um, for the researchers amongst our listeners, you've probably heard about FAIR data, and we'll talk a little bit more about that also during this episode. But yeah, so what is FAIRPOINTS, starting with that? Sure, yeah. Uh, so FAIRPOINTS uh, is a, a community initiative. Um, I got roped in by, uh, by Sarah and Chris and others. And, and um, uh, essentially, the idea is, uh, I found it through an interest and experience in software carpentry and data carpentry. So I've done that for many years. And I, I really believe in um, upskilling and, and training for, for scientists who aren't necessarily going to be coders, but they sort of want, you know, to be at least at the carpentry level for that kind of stuff, be able, be able to, to, to do things um, and to learn basic data science skills and programming. Uh, so so that, that's great. And so uh, we didn't see something similar that was focused on fair data stuff, like, like really kind of getting into the weeds of, of making digital objects findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable, that sort of thing. Um, and on top of that, uh, we, we shared an experience, and I certainly had as well, in, in you know, a certain level of, of brittleness of, of the, the carpentry's instructional material. Maybe brittleness isn't the right word, but it, it's very nice and prepackaged. But there isn't an obvious way to take little bits and pieces of it and, and combine, you know, little lesson nuggets to, to form a complete workshop that you, you, you trust will be coherent. You can kind of do that a lot on your own as an instructor, um, but there aren't sort of, you know, lots of variants of the same sort of lesson. You kind of want to take it as is and, and pick and choose. Um, and so we thought it'd be wonderful to not only do something that sort of teaches people about implementing FAIR and then making their, their data findable and doing that sort of thing, uh, but doing it in, in, a, in a FAIR way of kind of making these little nuggets, these little FAIR points um, mm. uh, where you can kind of assemble them and, and find and inter interoperate all this lesson material um, that, that sort of can help uh, people deliver, you know, instruction on, on how, to, how to go FAIR. Um, so we, we got really excited about that idea and um, wanted to start off uh, with uh, piloting that as a series of uh, lunchtime talks where lunchtime is wherever the speaker's lunchtime is. So so very international um, and uh, kind of having a little hack together on uh, on the notes from that se session and, and turning those into what we term fair points and sort of to, to make the outcome of, of that sharing um, fair and, and towards uh, helping uh, instructional material. Uh, so that's that's what Fair Points is all about. Um, we've had a couple of uh, talks so far, and, and uh, yeah, I'm just really happy to be involved with that. I think it's a great idea. Yeah, I think it's a brilliant idea. And maybe for the listeners who so far weren't really, or might have not been too easy to follow what this discussion was about, um, stepping a, a few steps back, it's about research data and now within the scope of open science, there's uh, quite a buzz and talk around making your research data fair, which means, as you said, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And that's much easier said than done. And most researchers that I've met and also personally did struggle to how to actually implement that. And this is what um, Fairpoints is actually about, to make it approachable, to make a 
like to find and showcase best practices, how implementation actually happens, how to make your data fair as a researcher. And also to share the message that it's probably impossible to make a fair your data fully fair, like from one moment to the to the next, but the goal is oh, it's basically a process and as fair as possible. And maybe now is also a good time to explain the difference, which which is a common misconception in my experience and the courses that I give, and probably also for you, um, or to what I assume, that often fair and open data are being used as terms and interchangeably so. Um, but what's the what's the difference between open data and fair data? Let's maybe talk about yeah, that. Yeah, sure, absolutely. Um, so. Openness, you know, connotes that sort of anyone can get access to it. Um, you, you'll, you'll never be, be turned away. You know, maybe you have to, you know, fill out a form or something. Maybe it's not easy, but really anyone can have access. Um, FAIR is, is more about uh, machine actionability. It, it, it's really about it being really straightforward, not just for humans, but for really dumb agents of humans, you know, programs to be able to get all this stuff. Um, and you can, you can have some fair data infrastructure and be uh, a, a private company and, and do everything internally. And you can benefit from you know, all of your historical data, your proprietary data being fair so that you can go and fetch what's relevant for a new problem and uh, you know, featureize machine learning uh, and, and, and run those things and, and get a lot of benefit from your data. And, and benefit from, from fear without any of it being beyond your firewall. Um, uh, whereas, whereas open is, is a, a bit more of a, a you know, I see it as, as something, a philosophical benefit, but also practical benefit for science where um, it, it's kind of similar to, to something that uh, the creator of Linux and Git said where, uh, like more eyes makes all bugs shallow. I think, I think I'm, I'm paraphrasing it um, in, in terms of programming. So, so that's, that's the idea of open source code is just by, by having it openly accessible, um, you'll get contributions from, from people and systems that you weren't expecting or soliciting, but who still find themselves interested and wanna be stakeholders and consider themselves stakeholders in, in your success and the project success. And so you just get better software that way. Uh, and so that's the idea of, of you know, op open data, you know, and for open science is, is the idea that you're just going to get better science mm -hmm. worldwide if, 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 if that's the case. And the more you can make things open, it's just going to be better. Um, whereas, you know, fair also it's, it's going to be better, but you don't necessarily have to be have to be open to do that. You, you can be sort of protective protective about it. Um, I think that for for effective open science, uh, at least some degree of fair is a prerequisite for that. Um, because if you're really opening things up to everyone, you know, unless things are fair, it's going to be really hard to coordinate contributions and, and people to be able to find what's interesting to them and, and what they can contribute their expertise to and how. Um, so I, I think fair is, yeah, what would I say? Open science subsumes fair, um, I, I would say, uh, in my opinion. Yeah. I totally agree with that because as much as open science sounds nice and friendly, but if you literally only publish your data set without any context or explicit description to it, there's really no use of having that online because nobody else but the person who generated the data will be able to contextualize. And even that, like going from our own data, we might forget within the, the scope of a, within a week of what the context was like for some specifics and then not being able to recap that like a week or a month or a year or three years later towards the end of our PhD or whatever. Right. So it's really also making ourselves a favor to have our data in a fair or archived and documented in a fair manner. And I think the key or one of the key components of having fair research data is the metadata center, which is basically a description as rich as possible, as, as informative as it can be. Um, 
yeah, without overexhausting ourselves, but also assuming details that might be interesting in the future to have recorded. <laughs> um, yeah, and like instead of skipping some, assuming, oh, this is not important to me now, but it might be later. Just keeping that in mind. This also, I'm speaking of my own experience here. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Uh, another thing I, I just thought of that I think is a really great articulation of this difference of, of open data and like you know, fair, it doesn't have to have fair in it, but it, it's, a, it's a design note on linked data that Tim Murders Lee wrote um, many years ago. It, it, it's, it's, it's on linked open data and it has like five stars. And, and you know, the, the, the first star is, you know, for, for, your, for your data is, is it available on the web in whatever format, but with an open license? And so it can be a scanned PDF with mm -hmm. an open license. And that's, that's already, you get a star because that's open data. And, you know, but then this, the second star is available as machine readable structured data. So like an Excel spreadsheet instead of an image scan of a table, mm -hmm. right? And then, then the third is like, okay, it's machine readable, but also using a non-proprietary format like mm -hmm. CSV instead of uh, Excel or like not, not needing any special program. And then sort of the stars above that are, are what you alluded to, it's kind of like using, using more standards so that people can identify things and more metadata and linking out to other things so that people understand context. And so all this stuff is, is this, this, this gradual verification, mm -hmm. um, but sort of the, the first part of that is like, well, it's open. You know, I, I, put a, I put a scanned image of a table up there and it's, it's, you know, it, it's you know, CC zero or, or CC by, so it, it's open and that's true and that's great. Um, but it's you know maybe not as helpful for um, for for mass consumption by by people's machine agents or programs and that sort of thing. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, what's your personal interest in these kinds of um, technical but also research related details coming from a background in is it data science and then also systems engineering? And now, because in your bio state, like you're on a mission to read the world of narrative centric science, what does that mean? Like, what's your mission and what do you try, to, how do you try to save the world? As in, what's the issue and how are you solving it? Or are well, you okay. So, um, yeah, what, what I didn't mention in the background, but I'll, I'll speak more, more about, um, I, I really believe in and the power of science and the accumulation of knowledge to help us solve uh, humanity's problems and, and beyond humanity, you know, all, all of our species. Um, uh, I studied uh, science and engineering. I was in electrical engineering, computer science. I, I studied nanofabrication um, and, and material science. And I was an experimentalist. I did theory. Um, and I, I sort of did a lot of stuff in, in the lab um, to help um you know, advance the kinds of systems we could make um the kinds of computing systems we could make and, and and the limits of materials so how we can sort of just do better stuff um and what i found is i was also really interested in um software and, and data stuff and, and and i realized that there was a limit to um you know the contribution that i can make by you know essentially putting another PDF out there um, or, 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 or that sort of thing. Or I, I would notice that when I uh, was trying to find prior art to, to, to benchmark my work or, or to see how things fit in context, it, it was really hard for me to do it. Like as an expert, I could read papers, I could understand them. You know, I, I had like a way of doing things very efficiently, like, you know, skimming abstracts and, you know, skimming figures and, and seeing if something's worth reading further. Um, but, but really there's, there's still a limit, you know, as a human, how much knowledge I can uh, consume and also be confident that I'm correctly interpreting um, based on my background. Um, and and I, I, I came across the idea of, of the semantic web um, and, and, and just, I thought that that was a really great idea. And, and the idea of, of machine actionability and, and fair. Um, I feel like the document web, the World Wide Web, um, did a lot of great stuff for spreading knowledge. I mean, 
in a way that a lot of, you know, some of the AI expert systems in the 80s and other things sort of tried to do with programming, just making all of these documents available um, in a standard way to allow search engines like Google, et cetera, to kind of you know, use page rank and, and, and all these algorithms to essentially connect all of these different human produced documents to, to surface what's interesting. And, and now people can, can do all sorts of stuff. They can search you know, through natural language and they can generally find what they want for, for a given thing. Um, where it isn't as strong is in terms of granular data, especially with, with science where things can get very domain specific and you care about units and qualifications and provenance of how the instrument was calibrated and all, all this stuff that you, you still as an expert have to like delve into the methods and materials section uh, of a paper, a, a narrative, you know, in English text or whatever. And, you know, there can be ambiguities and sentence structure and it, it, it's just really weird. Um, so I wanted to help with this sort of thing. And uh, for, for many years before I, I struck it out on my own, um, I was working for this, this material science project called the Materials Project out of Berkeley National Lab. Um, and I was kind of uh, a, a, a spider in the web, so to speak there. I was you know, helping doing data ingest and uh, making, making website features and essentially helping the, the material science community get more out of the data that was being produced um, cleanly by computational material scientists. Um, and so this was all sort of clean data. This wasn't necessarily, you know, messy experimental data. Um, but I, I sort of saw a lot of value in that and making APIs and then getting all that available and having the research community really find that valuable. Um, this, this open data uh, store and, and ways of accessing it in, in kind of fair ways. Um, However, I found there were still limitations um, to, to the approach that, that, that I did there. It wasn't sort of quite truly fair. You know, a, a human still needed to like read the API documentation, understand what each thing meant. And th there's just a, a long way to go essentially. And, and I realized this was even broader than, than what I was doing there. And, um, and I wanted to be able to do it more broadly with, with different communities. Um, and so that, that's sort of what led me to you know, the path that I'm on now. Um, and in, in terms of narrative centric science specifically, it, it's kind of like a, the flip side of, of machine centric science, um, which, which uh, I, I feel is um, a base expression of, of FAIR. I, I feel like um, a lot of uh, people when they read into the FAIR principles, um, they, they might think that it, that human actionability is, is, is kind of fine. As long as humans can find things, access things, you know, then that's fine. But uh, I don't read into that. And I, 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 I've heard things from, from Baron Mons, the, the, the lead author on that. And he, he also struggles with convincing people that really it is about the, the machines. You know, does the machine know what you mean? Um, and, and then, you know, people will follow because when things are machine centric, you can use, um, you know, programming to generate user interfaces that people can understand and, and, uh, and that sort of thing. Um, and a, a sort of another illustration of this is uh, we had a talk at Fair Points the other day, uh, one of the founders of, of Research Equals, um, where they're, they're trying to do little, little modules of research. Um, and the idea there is, is you might publish a bunch of things at a time that isn't necessarily a paper. You might publish your plan, you might publish a data set, you might publish all this stuff. And from that, you might form, form a narrative and it, that narrative might have multiple authors <laughs> over time who sort of didn't pre-coordinate with, you know, who's gonna do the analysis or, or, or whatever. And, and from that, you might be able to string together and synthesize many different narratives. You know, many different, like, here's an introduction, here's our plan, here's the data we gathered, here are the conclusions. You could have many different narratives around that, um, just like you have, many different um, branching histories in a, in a Git source repository. You might sort of have many narr narratives around um, little points, of connected points of science. And so I feel like uh, having science be centered on a bunch of PDFs that we then kind of can synthesize uh, knowledge from through, you know, natural language processing and, and all this stuff, that, that seems silly. It, it, it seems silly to um, 
to, to bury our data so that we can mine it, um, you know, we're, we're sort of hiding it by, 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 by putting it in all this, 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 uh, this natural language reporting. Um, so that, that's sort of what I want. I, I would like to see, um, w which we couldn't really do, you know, 200 years ago, or, or even, even really, you know, 30 or 40 years ago, things weren't quite there, the infrastructure, um, you know, the opportunity to, to make machine centric science um, and to not have, have narratives be like the primary quantum unit of, of scientific progress. Um, and, and so that's, that's what I, I want to go for. And I feel like the, the FAIR principles are, are a nice articulation of that goal. Um, and yeah, that, that, that's sort of my take on, 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 on machine centric versus narrative centric science. And, and um, it, it would just make things more flexible. So I feel like people could um, get more out of scientific progress, um, things that, that aren't necessarily um, valued initially, like, like, like bad results, quote unquote, um, you know, might end up being central to a different narrative. Mm. And, and the fact that they're published makes them be, be part of multiple different narratives and they can be cited, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I feel like um, there, there's that part of it too. Yeah. yeah, that rings, that resonates, um, well, rings several bells and also resonates deeply with um, as I see it. I believe that as humans, we need narratives, as in, that's how what our brains can process, like as an in information. So I feel that the, the fact that the scientific writing didn't change at all really in the past two or 300 years, um, ever since it's being documented in journals. Um, and now we have PDF files, which are also to the most part not machine readable still. But <laughs> also as someone who works with a team of African scholars running a preprint repository, uh, Africa Archive, I've, I've only learned three years into our work that it's better practice to share or deposit um, not PDFs, but XML files or both possibly to make it human mm -hmm. and machine readable and searchable and whatever. So yeah, to have that kind of machine access point or AI access point to be able to, yeah, to screen for keywords in a, in a, yeah, in a reasonable amount. And also there's never been so much data and research sharing as we have today. There's never been so many PhD students producing results and then packaging that into PDFs. Who's gonna read all that? I also give courses in scientific writing and I tend to tell people like, make sure that you put it in a format that's machine readable because honestly, like you can guess that maybe three people are actually read your paper unless it has access points for machine, uh, um, unless it's machine readable, so it can be traced for keywords and thereby be discovered. So I totally agree that in this age and time we live in today and the masses of research output that's being produced from around the world and also the huge challenges we are experiencing as humankind with, I don't know, um, political circumstances. Hopefully the one that we currently experience is in Eastern Europe is gonna by the time most of you are listening to this will be um, peacefully, well, peacefully isn't, well, that's, that, okay. That's, it's already beyond that point, but hopefully it won't exceed from here. Let's put it that way. Um, but also we have still climate change. We are still in the middle of a pandemic, which hopefully becomes endemic at some point. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's about time that we put our heads together as scholars from around the world, listen to more to each other and also make the information accessible and searchable from each corner of this planet to really be able to solve many, if not all of these channel challenges and also channels. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, I, I think I, Okay, so do you see, I'm also a bit skeptical because I'm not, I'm not from a data science approach. So I trust machines and robotics, but also 
data science approaches so much because it's, at some point I can't follow, like my, um, I was going to say mentally, mm -hmm. you know, conceptually. But um, so do you see also drawbacks as in algorithms? You know, there's also this debate, like there's still biases because they're still human made, so they can only be as smart and as functional mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. the people's brains of those who program them or design them. Yeah. I, also, there's probably never going to be a perfect system. Also, nature hasn't found one. So that's therefore we continue to go through evolution. So maybe the skepticism shouldn't be too large. But what are some of the challenges that you see in a data centric approach or yeah, a machine search approach through research information? Was that a sentence? I'm sorry. <laughs> no, yeah, no, 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 that, that, that's great. Um, uh, also, um, just before that, I, I realized something, uh, an analogy I also wanted, wanted to make mm. that could also help clarify, uh, you know, narrative centric versus machine centric. Um, you know, I do a lot of work in Jupyter notebooks, mm. um, w w which I love. And, and so, so those, those were a way to, 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 to knit together narratives. Um, uh, but, but so the current, you know, publication centric system, narrative centric is almost like, you know, if everything that the notebook needed was in the notebook and, and then that's it, whereas, whereas now like part of the, the, you know, the niceness of a notebook is, is you want to present the notebook to someone else. Mm -hmm. Um, but in a lot of the stuff that you, you know, the, the Python libraries that you import and all these things that you, you, you run in the cells are actually published elsewhere. <laughs> And, and you kind of, you know, with, with Python, you kind of pip install them or all, all this stuff. And so you, you bring all these dependencies into the environment of the notebook and create your narrative. Um, but, but not everything is, is locked away there. Um, and, and so I think that that's, that's where I definitely agree with you. You know, humans like narrative and narrative is important. Um, but, but still, uh, you know, with Jupyter Notebooks, the narratives um, are put in front of you, but they're, they're kind of not, not centric to the whole the whole enterprise. Um, yeah, in, in terms of, uh, yeah, machine biases and stuff, I, I definitely agree with that. I, I think more or less, um, uh, you know, I, I, think, I think Steve Jobs said once that he envisioned the computer as a bicycle for the mind. Um, and so I feel like a lot of this AI stuff is, is like a, a race, race car for the mind which is to say that you're still limited by the mind. So, so, so whatever someone can do, like computers can do it really, really fast, a lot, a lot faster. But, but if, if they're, you know, people with a lot of biases, then like the computer can execute those biases really, really fast <laughs> at, at that scale. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm with you on that, that there's, there's nothing inherently better about them. I, I'm, I'm reading this, this book now by, by the Dreyfus's called Mind Over Machine. Um, where it talks about a, a model of, of, of uh, skill acquisition and going from novice to advanced beginner to competent to proficient to expert and all these things and sort of the, the limitations of, of machines that like you know going up to a few of those levels but they're, they're sort of they're, they're, they're hard to do other things and they're, they're limits to what you can do with symbolic logic and um, you know there's something to be said for the connectionist deep learning things you have now um, that are sub symbolic but 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 still like as you mentioned, you're, you're kind of going to reproduce the experience that you're given, and so if you're if you if you sort of put a lock on what kind of experience and training and, and, and modeling you can give a machine, then you know garbage in, garbage out. You're going to get the biases in, biases out. Um, and so, I guess what I can say is that uh, in, in the best case, these machines would be uh, agents for us, um, but you'd still want human authority and, and trust to be involved in, in, in sort of deploying and harnessing these things. Um, you know, you, you mentioned the context of, you know, are we gonna be able to read all these papers? Probably not, but I'm imagining, uh, you know, someone having a machine agent that can kind of read all the papers for them mm. in a way that they would have read them or, or, mm -hmm. or, or, or you know, um, and, and you, you can get into trouble with that because like, what if, what if a, a paper reader is, is, is trained on your advisor as a PhD student, then it'll sort of read all of the papers as your advisor. 
reads them, but that's not actually what you want. You kind of, you might have a different perspective than your advisor on certain things. So again, it, it, it's really hard, um, mm -hmm. but it, yeah, you do run into that, that issue where um, your, your, your speed of performance is very fast and it, it outpaces your speed of learning. So, you know, when you're reading papers as a human, you know, you, you, can, you can read a paper in a few minutes, maybe, maybe, but let's say you read a paper really quickly and skim it in a few minutes. You can also learn what things you want to rethink in, the, in those few minutes and you can iterate on that. Whereas with a computer, you know, you can read, you know, thousands of papers in, in, in minutes, um, but you, you still, you don't recover all of that, that uh, reflection time. Um, so that, yeah, that's, that's, that's not something I, I really know how to, how to solve. I, I don't really have a great idea for it. Um, all I can say is, is I imagine there's, there's still a lot of low hanging fruit where, where things probably seem kind of boring for someone. They don't really expect to have their perspective changed so much. They kind of just want to read a bunch of stuff in, in the same way. And they want to see what the result of that is. And I think machines are excellent for doing that. Um, and I mean, part of that is, is whatever you call it, data literacy, algorithm literacy is, is sort of understanding um, what, what kinds of things work. Um, and, and what's nice is, is in practice, uh, I see a lot of research that um, a lot of the simpler algorithms for learning work, work very well um, if you have sufficient data and sufficiently clean data rather than having very complicated algorithms. So, so even you know, if someone who's not an expert in machine learning or computer scientist, I think a lot of these things could ultimately be explained pretty well to a practitioner. Um, uh, I mean, they, they already understand their domains very well, you know, in the domain of science or social science or that sort of thing. So I think understanding how, how the computer is ex executing a particular thing, um, it, it can just sort of be, 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 part, of, be part of research. Um, another thing I, I heard the other day, um, and this is definitely more of a cultural thing, but, you know, in, in experimental sciences and engineering, you definitely have, you know, uh, environmental health and safety departments that, you know, require you, like, if you're going to work with a laser, you need to take training <laughs> to make sure, you know, you can, you can work safely with a laser. And if, and if you're going to work around radiation, again, you need to take a training class, you need to have personal protective equipment. They're all, all, all this training because there are hazards associated with the work that you're doing. And I think, you know, it, it's not quite recognized um, yet, but I think it could be more firmly recognized that there are hazards working with data mm. where, where, if, if, where we, there could be training for this is how you work with data to avoid biases. There, there are hazards working with, with data as a researcher that we want you to be aware of and, and be certified and you know, re, 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 renew every year. Um, so it, it, it's, it's an experimental apparatus just like any other you know, data that's collected. Um, so I think there's an opportunity for that as well uh, in, in the sciences. I think that's an excellent point. I haven't actually thought about that. I took notes as you spoke, um, and I felt before you mentioned the last thing now, that it's there's probably a need for expectation management. What can you expect to learn from any data point, data item, really? Um, in order, as you kind of, I think, highlighted now, is to avoid misinterpretation of whatever is being presented as a data set. Um, and also I have algorithms be trained not to misinterpret, but just present according to keywords or whatever you teach them to look out for, and then come up with some of some results. And then I, I agree totally. I think there should be like a training or a checklist of what can you draw from whatever the algorithm is presenting you as an output. And where should you draw the line? Like what cannot be concluded from an analysis because it's full of biases or because there's not enough metadata associated. So it can't be any interpretation in one or the other direction. And I think SIGHT is doing like is, is heading in that direction. Um site dot, dot AI. Um just sharing, we, we can also share this in the show notes, but just sharing this now for you in the chat. Um, and this is where they also use a keyword search in weighing then, or it's, it's artificial intelligence analysis of the text, but it's still, sim well, it's complex, but simple. 
so that I look out for words to weigh is there more pro or con in the citation of a particular article? And has it been cited positively or negatively in order to draw conclusions about is this highly debated or is there a common agreement? Okay, there's a solid um, approach or... In, and, and I think that's also um, critical and also cite themselves say that there's, you know, we need way more data in order to have better outputs of this and should be cautious in interpreting the results. So you still have to read the paper if you want to have your own opinion weighing in. So, yeah. But yeah, it's, it's an exciting learning curve that we like now in the digital age using this machine of, um, machine reading approach. And there's a yeah. lot of in between, I feel, which is really exciting also for us as um, science service providers in how we can sensitize researchers, what they can do with their data and also how they can prep their data so that can be reused and analyzed by others. Yeah, uh, one other thing I was, I was just thinking of, like a benefit of, of machine actionability, um, sort of having something be presented in a way that a machine agent can act on it is, uh, you know, again, as you mentioned, um, there, there there may be certain conclusions that could be drawn from presenting data in a certain way that you know where where an expert looking at that might say um, you can't draw that conclusion <laughs> because of because of this. Um, and if if data is presented and published in in the machine accessible way, you can you could scale that kind of expertise. So so someone could could sort of write down that rule logically and then you could send out a crawler that like that, that runs on all this data and could highlight these rule violations. Um, and, and you know programmers get this kind of thing all the time in integrated development environments. Um, like uh, I'll, I'll be writing some code and there, there are programs running you know asynchronously to me typing that will say things like you should probably refactor this or like You've just defined a keyword that you know is, isn't wasn't defined elsewhere, or, or, or like you're adding these two variables, but one of them's an integer and one of them's a string. So you know <laughs> maybe you want to take a look at that. So it, it's kind of like in a word processor that will highlight you using a dictionary you know, spelling errors or grammar errors, but it's a lot more granular because it has knowledge of of the struct of, of structure. You know, because because you know, program programming language syntax is, is is data structures, abstract syntax trees, and so similarly, you know, imagine researchers, you know, preparing data things in in, the, in kind of a machine actionable format. They could get this kind of feedback really early on on, uh, you know, the accuracy of their analyses and whether they can draw certain conclusions, and they won't necessarily need to be experts in, in statistics or, or something. So I mean, this is this is this is a grand vision, but this is the kind of thing that uh, you know, at its core, is enabled by, you know, the stuff that you create, a machine being able to sniff out and look at, rather than it just being paragraphs of text that, you know, a machine has to go through a natural language processing understanding layer in order to do anything with it. Um, so. That that's a possible incentive <laughs> is, is it might sort of help people develop better work in the same way that a lot of programmers, you know, will, will like to use um, linters and IDEs rather than just, you know, use a plain text editor and throw it up on GitHub and then have the integration test say like, hey, this is wrong. You know, they, they kind of can have something more local. Mm. So, yeah. Yeah, now that you mentioned NLP, natural language processing, from my experience in workshops and also being a non-native English speaker myself, um, like it tends to be hard for people whose first language is not English to translate the research into well, a foreign language really. And then, but also when I had first English, first language English speakers in the course, they said they have the same issues because technical writing is not the same as natural language in English, both, right. both in English. 
So, um, what's your take? It's like, on the other hand, this is also something we discussed in another episode um, with Maureen Archer. Like, technical writing in some disciplines nowadays is way beyond like what's humanly conceptualizable in some <laughs> some regards. So, like, as a researcher, try and keep it simple in wording so that it stays comprehensible to most of your readers. That's just a side note. But when it comes to machine accessibility of machines, I would guess prefer technical writing. And then the question is, is that a threshold that, or a, an, a point where the machines and humans can easily mis misunderstand each other? Like irrespective of your cultural backgrounds or language background, but also with technical language versus natural language, if that makes sense. Yeah, I, I, I think that's very astute. Like, because we generally just have narrative, we try to cram in human understandability and machine understandability <laughs> into the same channel. <laughs> Yeah. So, 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 so you might have people who like want things to be readable to humans, but they might also think like, oh, how can I make my, my paper NLP ready? Like, 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 how can I make sure that like a machine can also understand this? And it's like, ugh, you, you're, you're conflating your readers. You know, it's hard to write to two different audiences at the same time. Mm. You know, one of the cardinal rules of the presentation is, is know your audience. And it's like, well, it's, it's, you know, I have some people who want this and some people want this. It's going to be a really silly presentation that's not going to be really helpful to either party. Um, and so I, I definitely agree. Like I, I know that there's this 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 book um, called called the Pyramid Principle. It's about business writing, and it advocates a style of writing that's essentially like prologue logic programming. You kind of like will have your goal statement at the top, and you should start with that, and then you know whatever you need to support it as sub goals, then kind of do that. It, it, it's basically like you know what you really want to do is, is program, but you have to write English sentences. So like like do it like this, and it'll be logically clear. Um, mm -hmm. And and you know the other thing is you know some fields have it. I wouldn't say easier, but but uh, um, like you'll get uh, in, in in a lot of math papers you'll have these what, what I've heard termed in, in a podcast by someone a, a, a portal abstraction where, where where you kind of have this word. And because no one else is really using that word in this way, like you really get to go on it. So like, like in math, I think the word was like, uh, like monoids. Um, so like certain, certain words that are sort of very technical um, that aren't used in everyday speech, you know, it's, it's great to use those in natural language because you're almost certain what they're going to refer to. And you can like look up that word and find other papers on it and, and be sure that they're talking about the same thing. You know, versus something that, that's more more ambiguous. When I was a graduate student, um, I was working in lithography, and there's this idea of, of resolution, optical resolution. So, you know, um, and, and people use different definitions, even within that subfield. You know, talk. You know, resolution is it equal? You know, what what does ten nanometer resolution mean? You know, does it mean you know the the the, the half pitch between two features that you can you can write? Is is it the smallest? You know, uh, feature dimension uh, of a thing, and, and and people, you know, were very uh, uh, adamant and, and passionate about, you know, what the definition of resolution was. Um, and in other, you know, in other contexts, resolution has nothing. You know, conflict resolution, it, it, it's it's whatever. Um, whereas, you know, a, a math term like like monoid or, or or functor, you know, it just sort of rarely occurs outside of that context. So you're you're more certain what that's going to mean. Um, and so. I, I don't think there's a really a solution to this other than to have the separation of like here's here's my my machine consumable thing my my, my sort of base thing it encoded in, in whatever you, you mentioned xml for your archive or just something that is not necessarily for humans as an audience but then there's a companion document or multiple companions derived from that that is for humans as as an audience and can be a lot more flexible um, and not have to be nlpable um, because they're for humans. It's for humans. And if a human wants to delve deeper in a programmatic way, then there's a program there's a program representation of that data, of that, of that, um, of the providence of the experiments and, and the methods and and you know the breakdown of, of how an experiment was done. Um, so yeah, I, I think a separation of 
of, of narrative in the you know machine centric digital asset uh, would really be helpful instead of people having to cram both of these audiences into the same channel. Mm. Wow. Okay. So still some work to be done in that, um, <laughs> that chapter. So um, can I just ask you, I think this might take us back to what could have been another beginning of this episode. What is your understanding of open science now also with the information that we already shared with the listeners um, with your focus on data analysis and um, research data being fair um, in a perfect world or opting towards that. Um, because I'm asking this because now we, we like as a research community around the world, everybody is using nowadays this buzzword open science, thinking it's a new thing. In my world, it's nothing new. It's just good research practice as we, most of us start and, and assume we will put ourselves up to just not sure how to do it. And open science now is more than one, more than a hundred approaches to how to do that by discipline, by research topic, by um, experiments or set up. And there's no one answer how to practice open science and also Coming back to open does not necessarily mean it needs to be 100, 100% open, just as open as feasible is what I tend to say. But in my trainings, I'd say when, even if it's actually about open science or what we now understand as open science, I tend to say it's forget about the term. Let's just talk about good research practice and what challenges you observe in your own research and how can we find a workaround. So that's to me, open science, just to set the stage what is your take to open science and i believe there's like i've also seen several definitions so there's not one definition of what open science should or should be or is but yeah there are several common themes that are part of open science and, and various understandings of what it should entail and what's not open science Okay, so, so to, to, to paraphrase again, or to restate, uh, is the question... Uh, that was what, a long question. What is a, what should That's be open problem. science? Uh, like, no, what, what in your personal take with your approach with data analysis, and now also like a professional trainer, consultant, mm -hmm. and machine-centric? Okay, so it's, your approach is not so much generally about open science, but more about research data and how to make that fair and machine readable. But yeah, if, right. like, if you think about the, the term open science, what comes to mind to you in your context? Sure. Uh, what comes to mind to me is uh, that it, the, the open science for me feels a bit like um, like open standards, open protocols, like that kind of thing. Um, in the sense that I see open science as good science in the sense that it's science that you can plug into. You know, mm -hmm. if, if, you have, if you have like like an open plug in the wall, you can you can plug something into it. Um, and it, it's, it, it's this ability to be built upon mm -hmm. because, because you, you don't have to like go in and open it up and see what's in there and like, um, so I'll, I'll give an example in terms of um, uh, a, a non, a, a originally non-open, uh, you know, research project maybe in, in, a, in a private company. Um, you know, even 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 a company might want to uh, quote unquote collaborate in a sense, and, and they often do. Like like uh, you know, a company might send a job out to uh, what's what's called a, a contract research organization to, to, to do some part of what, what they need to do. And, and the information flow is, is like a diode, you know, uh, you know, the, like the company like won't really share that much. They'll only show that sure like what the CRO needs to needs to do and then, then they can send information back. Um, but oftentimes there, you know, it, it'll be really horrible when like 
the, the CRO you know, returns you know, a, a scanned PDF of what they did, or it, it will, they'll, they'll misinterpret the experimental protocol that, that the, the company you know, wants, wants to be done. Um, so you know, a, a private company might have different people that are sharing in its data output ecosystem and data lifecycle. These contract research organizations, a, a partner organization, you know, even if you're doing protected research, you might reach out to a collaborator. Um, there might be a collaborator across time. You, you may have, have the, the, the thing said and done, but then you publish it and then someone reaches out to you and wants to, you know, do a follow-up or something. And, and, you know, at that point, you sort of want it to be open. Um, so I, I guess open to me means more like open a bowl. Uh, the the yeah. idea that, uh, that, that you can facilitate collaboration um, among people over space and time that you may not have originally intended in your original plan. Um, you, you may have seen over time that this, this, this project could actually benefit from adding more people to it with different expertise. Um, and, and so, you know, the quote unquote openness can be managed with uh, access control and licenses. I mean, even, even open source is, is like, open is, is, depends on the license. There could be open, you know, for data, like the Creative Commons, you know, with attribution or like, you know, CC zero, like no attribution necessary. Or with, with open source, there could be, you know, so-called permissive licenses like MIT and BSD or, or so-called, you know, copyleft licenses like, like, like GPL. They're all open. Um, they, they, you know, they, they, don't, they, don't, they don't say like, you, you cannot participate. They say, here are the terms mm -hmm. on, you know, by which you can participate. We want to participate. And so um, I feel like even stuff that's, that's like sort of closed with, with research, like you sort of, you, you want it to be open a bull. You, you want to be able to, to, to say like, oh, we could, you could use this person's opinion and like get this expert on the project and not have it take us six months to mm -hmm. like figure out how to get them the data and mm -hmm. get, you know, it, it, it should be less than that. So even though you're not sharing it right away, you, you, you kind of, it, it's an open system. Um, yeah, so that, that's what I think of as open science. So I, in that sense, I agree with you. It just seems like that's the way it should be done because otherwise, you know, you, you have all this, 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 this friction around opening things up when you decide they need to be open. Um, but, but you can make them open the bowl and, and, and fair without making them, mm. you know, freely accessible to anyone, to the public right away. And that, that, that's, you're still practicing open looking science. So, yeah. Thank you so much for sharing this. Really a new perspective also for me to look at that, especially with the, with the conversation we had just before this. Mm. Huh. Yeah, that's, <laughs> I also like the term openable research, openable science. Yeah, that's probably a better approach as compared to open science flat out because it's, it's often, it's too often being misinterpreted and scares people away. It's like, what? I have to be fully transparent? That's not, that's not what I came here for because <laughs> there's so much. Right. Yeah. Life, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I, I guess I guess it's, it's gotten a lot of traction recently because of, of open source, and so that's 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 why it's taken that term and ridden off the popularity of that. And and yeah, for the same reason, you know, um, a lot of people think open source is just means sort of it, it, it's it's free, but you know, really, um, you know, I, I see a lot of repositories on GitHub that don't have a license, and mm -hmm. and so they're they they say they're open, but you know, if I need to use it, I'll, I'll contact them. And I'll say like, hey, there's no license. I don't. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I can use this or not. <laughs> sure. um, because by and, default, that's also what I didn't know before I came across this license debate. Like by default, everything is protected by copyright. Like any- right, all, it, Yeah, by, by default, you know, all, all rights reserved for the author, by mm -hmm. the author, you know? Um, and, and yeah, like, like a, lot of, a lot of companies, like, like I'll, I'll be in a contract and they'll say, you know, you cannot use any GPL software because it, it's open, but, but, it, but, it, but it means that, you know, if, if we build on that, then we have to make our software open, which we don't want to do. So there are all, all these different, you know, uh, meanings of, of open that, that aren't necessarily what, what people would think of, which, which probably means, you know, I'm, I'm putting it, all, you know, on a table in the middle of the park and anyone well, can, can just go it. and get it. You can look at it, but <laughs> yeah. don't touch it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Wow, okay. 
Thank you so much. Um, maybe closing off, I'd like to go back to our um, our icebreaker questions that I shared with you before we met here for this episode. So when I ask you about a researcher you find inspiring, you mentioned Brett Victor. Who's that? Oh yeah, yeah. Um, you know, Brett Victor, uh, he, he he has a an electrical engineering background like me. <laughs> Um, he actually went to Cal as well for, for I think his master's. Um, but uh, he, he has done a lot with helping me imagine and a lot of other people imagine um, what the internet you know, can, can sort of help us do in terms of understanding things and explaining things. Um, like, like there's this one essay you have called Magic Ink, where you kind of explain like internet is like magic ink. Like, like, like why are we doing stuff like we don't have computers? And like there's one presentation called Stop Drawing Dead Fish, where, um, you know, just things and he, he's, he's very empathetic with scientists where he sort of doesn't want scientists and researchers to have to like use these tools that that you know are reminiscent of a day when we don't have computers that can sort of help us do things and so this is this is part of you know why I like machine actionability um and so yeah so so Brett Victor has just done a, he's, he's published a lot of inspiring um single page interactive essays that prototype lots of ideas about how you can have you know interactive systems like like imagine like a news article where you know it, it mentions some numbers in, in a conclusion and you can just click and drag on one of the numbers to ch change all the other numbers and the conclusions so you, you kind of have have like the, the author's model is actionable for you quantitatively in real time you don't have to like go and download the software and do this and, and so you, again the, the you know, the narrative is important, but you can kind of interact with, with the data on your own terms, you know, modify assumptions. Mm -hmm. um, and, and yeah, I mean, he's recently, I think he, he started a, a space in Oakland, California called Dynamic Land that um, is, is you know, sort of, again, in, in, in this realm of like, how can we use machine technology to kind of help people better create and collaborate mm -hmm. uh, in, in ways that are really imaginative and, and aren't just sort of like, the equivalent of like you know we have we have folders on our on our on our computers or on our desktop and that's like that's like very much like like we have a desk a physical desk and a folder and then we're just we're just taking that on a screen now and he's very much about like we can do more than just like what we did and now it's on a computer <laughs> like we can do so much more and and I, I just I love that and, and I love that you know the 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 vision his articulation of vision coupled with his, his technical execution of, of, of these demos so that mm -hmm. you can really see like what it is. So, so that's another thing that inspires me um, is sort of, you know, being able to do implementations of these things, even just as proofs of concept. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah it yeah. sounds also a lot like what we spoke about earlier, like you not know, having openable software in this case, openable internet, like actionable without having to contact the originator of the information. Mm -hmm. But you can still do that as well. You don't have to. So that right. maybe also right. helps with language barriers and all kinds of other obstacles that might be in the way. Great. Um, when I ask you about your favorite animal, you mentioned the koala. Is that because they're so fluffy? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just fluffy and cute. I remember like when I when I learned like just how much it sleeps, I was like, that's amazing. Mm. Maybe I was particularly tired that day, but I, I just love, you know, just the the, the extremity of that. I mean, yeah, I love that it's cute. I love that it's, um, that it's that, but I think I just like the, you know, just that, that being representative of such a dispersion among species of, of characteristics. Like it's, it's not, not just like, oh yeah, pretty much all animal, animals like sleep like 68 hours a day. You know, it's like, it's like, no, there's, there's, there's a lot of different life on the planet. Um, and yes, yeah, so but then also it's just very cute. So yeah, I kind of, it sort of stuck with me as my favorite animal. Yeah, and there I agree. Um, and then Nirvana Sliver as a favorite song. 
<laughs> so today yeah, yeah. I'm going to add, but I mean, there's also these evergreens and Kurt Cobain is certainly one of the uh, producer of such songs that will ever resonate or forever resonate with people. But why Sliver? Yeah. Oh, I, I don't know. I, I just, I just, I didn't think too hard about this one. I just, I, I listened to it a lot and I just love just the repetition of like, Grandma, take me home. Grandma, take me home. <laughs> and I just, I just love the energy of the song. And uh, it's, it's just, I don't know. It's just it's sort of raw and primal and um, it's just, it's simple. Like, like a lot of great songs are. Um, and I don't know, it's just something that, that, you know, will get in my head and I'll, I'll like it, you know? So I don't know, it doesn't take me too much on like favorite, favorite, but, but I, that's just sort of something that, that, that came up and I wrote down and I, yeah, I, so I just really like it a lot. Favorite songs sometimes change over time, and some yeah. songs just decide to stay with us for longer yeah. or for a lifetime. Yeah. Um, and then you seem to have a favorite restaurant in Boston. Is there a particular dish that they do really well? Oh, yeah, yeah, no, it's this dish called the No Name. <laughs> uh, and it, it's, a, it's a, this place called Grasshopper in, in, um, in the Alston neighborhood of Boston. Uh -huh. And uh, yeah, I, I just, I love that so much. So I, I'm, I'm vegan now. I've been vegan for a while. I was vegetarian at the time. I'd, I'd been vegetarian for, for many years. Um, and, and just one of the things that, that I like, that I enjoy um, for whatever reason is, is like mock meat. <laughs> um, and, you know, there's a long tradition of that in, in East Asia, doing that very well and inventively. And um, yeah, this, this it's, it's, it's sort of like the, almost like a, a, a sesame chicken fast mm -hmm. food Chinese dish. Um, but it, it's just, it's like, it's weak gluten and it's just absolutely fantastic. And uh, it, it was far away enough from, from where I was, you know, living when I was there that, you know, it would be special enough on special occasions to go. And, you know, whenever I'm back in, in the area, I, I try to make a special trip out there. Um, and yeah, honestly, I haven't checked on it since, since, you know, COVID-19, I hope, hope they're, they're still around. But um, yeah, that's, that's, that's sort of my, that's my favorite dish. It's just absolutely wonderful, you know, uh, sweet wheat gluten with sesame seeds, so like on broccoli. Okay. You got very big party. portion. Anyway. <laughs> Next time I'm on the that's States, it. I'll make sure to have a stopover around Boston. Yeah. Also, it's, uh, yeah. it's on my bucket list of places to visit. I've been to New York, but Boston is, well, not yet going to say I really want to go. Um, can I just ask you, because I'm also a vegetarian for the longest time, and when I became vegetarian, people thought, oh, maybe she doesn't like meat, but I was actually for animal um, welfare reasons, um, to put it positively. Um, but also, I really like meat when I decided not to eat meat anymore. So I can totally relate how having mock meat is like for some people it's irrational like why do you not eat meat but then you know, take all the soy stuff which is like meat but it's not it's not the real thing but damn it's close and yes i did like the taste of meat very much so and also my body kind of craves it so i'm really happy that we have these options now is it the same for you what, what made you a vegetarian in the first place and yeah no absolutely yeah i think like the principal reason for me is um uh uh environmental health. I just sort of saw the, the amount of resources and water and grain that goes into a pound of beef and all, and I'm just like, wow, the, envir the environmental economics of, of, of uh, animal technology are, are, are terrible. I, I've, I've been reading this book recently called, called After Meat. And yeah, it, it introduces this, this term that I hadn't heard before, animal technology. And it, it just emphasizes that, yeah, no, we, you know, you know, we have food and like animals are a technology that we've been using for, for, for food, for protein. And they're, they're really inefficient and we can do so much better now, yeah. so much better. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, also just, just better for our karma, I would add. Oh yeah, you know, yeah, so <laughs> there's, yeah. So, so yeah. I mean, strictly from the environmental economics part, but also, yeah, I, I definitely agree. You know, I, you know, I, I have, I have two dogs. I, I mean, I just, this, this, exceptionalism for canines versus other I, yeah i i, I think you know, a lot of animal life is yeah, yeah. It's, it's just it's all very valuable um but but yeah so so on that note i think like taste and textures is like i love that kind of thing and so like you know i i, I love you know 
Beyond Burger is an Impossible Burger, isn't it? And just all this this stuff. And yeah, I, I, <laughs> I yeah, I, I like the texture of all that stuff. Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oh. more like that on that. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, let's let's go for a vegan burger sometime when we meet physically. Yeah. Absolutely. And Boston, Boston is great. I hardly recommend that as well. Beautiful. Yeah, I heard good things about the city. Yeah. Yeah. So totally, like, it's totally, still gonna happen. Me being there, sometimes. Thank you so much for joining this episode, and of course, like, um, welcome back to another future episode at some point. Um, whenever we have some, or there's, there's, yeah, we spoke a lot about a lot of things. There's a lot of potential to go deeper on one or the other aspect, and probably also more that we will come up with um, as we move forward. So yeah, cool. any, Thanks. any last comments, any, anything you want to add as a, like before we close? Uh, no, just, just if, if um, I don't know if you heard anything I said and it resonated or, or, or like you hate it or whatever, either way, you know, strong reactions, uh, just feel free to, you know, reach out to me. I, I, you know, I, I love to talk with people about about this kind of stuff, about you know, fair data and, and, and machine-centric science, and you know, or really anything that I talk about, feel free to just reach out to me. Um, my personal site is is, is DonnieWinston.com. Um, you can get my email address from there. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, yeah. So, so uh, thank you yeah. for having me on. Yeah, it's a real pleasure, and we will put all your um, digital profiles on the affiliated, affiliated blog post. So contact details will be discoverable, accessible. So feel free to get in touch with Donny or reach out to us, um, to him through us here on this, in this circus, in this show. And welcome back to another episode sometime soon. See you around. <laughs>